am Jennifer Eileen, and I am so delighted to welcome you to my cafe, my pet info cafe. Pour yourself a warm cuppa, and let's chat about our love of animals. We all need the warmth and love that animals bring into our lives, and they need us too. In our cafe, we share tips, success stories, information for humans, and for our fur or feathered or finned family to have the happiest, most fulfilling lives together. Today, I am so happy to bring a very special animal communicator who helps families find lost pets. He is the host of the syndicated animal rights show on Pet Life Radio, contributes articles to many newspapers, magazines, and appeared on major television networks. Also, he is the former president of the Humane Society of Forsyth County in Georgia, a no-kill no shelter. He and his wife live near Atlanta, Georgia, with dogs and outdoor cats. He helps pet families build stronger relationships with his ability to communicate telepathically with all animals. He has helped reunite many families with lost pets. Our topic for today's Pet Info Cafe. Please welcome Tim Link, President and CEO of Link Swagging Tales Incorporated and best-selling author of Talking with Dogs and Cats and wagging tails, every animal has a tail. Welcome, Tim. Well, thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here and it's, uh, <laughs> it's an honor. It is an honor to have you, Tim. And um, I want to start with uh, where we met and a neighbor had referred me to you because my cat, Tiger, in 2009, had run away from home <laughs> in Middleburg, Virginia. And uh, I needed help finding him, so I, I engaged with you. And it was a, quite a journey, you know, I did all the things you're supposed to do for a lost pet, I put up signs, I wandered the neighborhood, and I did not find him. And you helped me communicate with him. And one of the lessons that came out of this for me was that, um, one of the points that you've made in your in your website is about why animals leave. Could we talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's one of the realities that people face when their pets go lost. Yeah, you know, it's it's a, it's a tough topic because obviously we love our animals. They're part of our family. Uh, we give them the best of everything. And so when we go missing, we wonder, well, what did we do wrong? Why would they not want to come back <laughs> to us? They have a wonderful house, everything they possibly can need. And of course, we know the, the sort of the, the common things, the normal things that we, uh, the reasons they leave, you know, they go on an exploration, perhaps they're in heat and they're going out to find a mate. Um, mm -hmm. They are uh, getting harm's way. Uh, there's various things, somebody leaves the door open too long. Um, but the things we don't realize is the fact that they're in our lives for a purpose, for a mission. Uh, they come to us for a particular reason. Those reasons vary on what they are. They could be to help you through a situation, uh, a relationship. It could help you through a, a transition in your life. Um, they could be there to provide you the love you never had and show you that love is existing. And so there's a whole lot of reasons that they come into our lives. And so when they are fulfilled that mission with us, or they feel they just cannot fulfill that mission with us for one reason or another, then oftentimes they will move on. Uh, sometimes they move on out of their bodies, they make their transition, and so they uh, you know, pass on because they fulfilled what they needed to fulfill. Other times they leave and they try to find someone else or family to fulfill that particular purpose. That's right, and that's, uh, it's such a, a hard and painful lesson, and I, I, I know that well. But what I want to say for the sake of the show is that several good things came out of this for me. One was I bonded with my neighbor, and we are still very good friends, very fast friends, a neighbor who had um, referred me to you. And second, that um, I adopted another cat that <laughs> Some, somebody <laughs> rescued. It was a case of mistaken identity, but he stayed around forever. That was Tigger too, and we all know very well. And the outcome of your communication with Tiger was the comfort that I got that in fact he had found another home. And it was very comforting because I had always felt that he wanted to be an outdoor cat and as a city dweller I was never able to allow him to do that. So he had the opportunity to live, as you said, in, in the life that he wanted. 
so um, I, I thank you for that, and I just think that's an important story for part of the story for us to talk about when we right, talk about exactly. lost hat pets. So, so thank you for that. It was such a huge contribution to my life. But I'd like to move on because we're talking about the, the telepathy, and let's talk about what is interspecies communication, and and yeah. how does how how did you find yourself? In, in interspecies communication. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a big word, big terminology that you're trying to put into a, a little box. Uh, and the best thing is, uh, the best way I can explain is that we all have a connection. So we have a connection with each other, animals have a connection with each other, and uh, they animals communicate in a telepathic manner. And so when we're young, when we're children, uh, we're taught to, you know, uh, we don't know any better. So we can have conversations with animals and, and plants and, and everything around us because uh, we haven't gone to school and been taught a, the appropriate way of communicating. Uh, over time, unfortunately, uh, that tends, we tend to lose that ability. Uh, we tend to not use that skill or that lesson or that, that inner being that we have. And so we have to get back to the point where we can actually open ourselves up, open our hearts, open our minds up to be able to communicate with uh, everything around us, uh, especially with the animals. Uh, my journey happened uh, quite surprisingly. Um, <laughs> and basically, uh, you know, I had been a uh, telecom executive um, with major corporations for 20 years and I traveled the world selling the latest, greatest technology <laughs> for cellular phones back in the days. and mobile devices as we call them today. And uh, life was good, everything was great. Um, there was a workshop that came to town about how to uh, communicate better with your animals and form a, a better understanding and relationship of them. I basically went to the workshop with my wife because it was her birthday weekend. So <laughs> I already had the, the flowers, I had the gift, I had the card. Now I got, you know, got this uh, opportunity to go to the workshop. And during the workshop, we learned how to breathe, how to calm our mind and settle that down, open our heart and accept the idea that whatever we receive when we're connecting with animals is the truth. And so uh, I practiced those techniques during the workshop. Uh, we had uh, numerous animals there, animal photos of animals and people, uh, their human companions would bring in questions that they had that they only knew the answers to or what they thought they knew the answers to. And we would focus on the animals, connect with them, ask those questions, and then get information back, whether it was words, feelings, colors, emotions, however they chose to communicate, uh, to collect that, write it down, and accept it. And so that's what I did. And so we went through a series of numerous, numerous uh, animals and questions, and each and every time I received some information, uh, usually a word or two or a, a mind's eye photo of what the animal is trying to communicate. Um, and I would write it down and I had no idea if it was uh, accurate or not. Uh, but each and every time I did this, not only did I receive information, but the information was 100% correct. And so it was quite an opening of my mind and my heart uh, to find out that, you know, I had this gift and I, I could recover the gift that maybe was deep inside for all those years. And so uh, that's sort of how the journey started. And it's been a whirlwind since then. I've been doing it for uh, close to 20 years now. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much for that background. There, there's so much to that interspecies communication. And actually, you came to Virginia a couple of times and did that, did a workshop that I attended. And then I've referred a friend to you to take the workshop online exactly. to learn how to yeah, do and it. it. Yeah, it's always a lot of fun to be able to, uh, you know, to teach and to share what I've gone through and, and open up those techniques so you can have a better relationship and a better bond with your animals and be able to communicate with them at a deeper level. That's so true. Well, moving on to the topic for today, which is about lost animals, um, there were a couple of stories that we picked out that we thought would be good examples. Um, in one case, you, you, um, you have done maps to help douse and find people or find find the pets. Um, right. I've, I've benefited from that myself, but could we talk about, we have a map that we're showing, and can you tell about, tell us about what the technique is that you use and how it's helped, helped people find their pets? Yeah, so, so when someone has a, a, a missing animal, it could be a lost or stolen animal, it could be one that's gone missing from, from their home. Um, 
they basically reach out to me and provide me with just some simple information that I need to get started. I need a photo of the animal, name of the animal, date missing, uh, the address missing, any sighting locations, and then any other helpful information that you may have. And that's basically all I need to get started. Then I connect with the animal, gather information that I think would be important. So are you inside? Are you outside? Are you with someone? If so, show me what that person looks like. Uh, what's your surrounding? What's your environment? So I go through a series of questions that uh, may help me determine uh, the situation, the condition, the mental and physical condition of the animal and what they're seeing around them. And then I take all that information and I set it aside and then I do a technique with, which was called uh, map dousing. And map dousing is like any other dousing. We're probably most familiar with using dousing rods to, to find an energy source such as a water well or an oil well, these type of things. Uh, what I do is pull a series of maps, uh, whether they're from the computer or they're hard copy maps, it doesn't matter. And then I use a pendulum. So I got my handy dandy little pendulum right here, just hmm. to give you an idea of what we're talking about. Cool. And so I, I connect with the animal, connect with the map, and try to determine where the energy is strongest. So I'll start a broad swath of where it is on that map using the pendulum, and then narrow it down to as small as area as I possibly can. And then I'll expand it a little more just to make sure I've got it all covered. And that gives me the information of where the energy is strongest for your animal, because I've made the connection, I've made the communication. And from there, that gives me the uh, opportunity to take the information that was provided combine that with the map and the energy area that is strongest and see if there's any things that I can see or determine uh, to help you uh, in your search. So I'll put pins, uh, push pins on the map and say, based on what was shared, based on the uh, map dousing, here's what the areas I would look at. Here's the homes I would look at. Here's the, you know, the trees or the park or whatever it may be to give you a, a, a narrower focus to be able to uh, go search for your animal. And at the same time, while I'm doing that is through the communication process is I'm asking your animal to show itself safely, return home if possible, be on the lookout for you, and try to get the animal to cooperate to uh, have a, a reunion with you. And that's <laughs> what we're uh, doing with the whole process of communication, map dousing, providing you all the information that you need and trying to convince the animal to uh, uh, form that great and happy reunion again. That's right. Now, um, do you have a particular story about this particular map that we're showing? Well, it, it's a, a map of a, a cat that went missing. And, uh -huh. you know, keep in mind, when I get contacted, it's, it's a daily thing. And I have no idea where the people are, are contacting me from until they do contact me. So I work with people from uh, Australia and New Zealand and uh -huh. Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia and all over the UK, coming back to everywhere here in the, the States and in North America and Hawaii. So it's a broad area. And when you're talking about the maps, um, you know, I'm not familiar with these places. I'm not on the ground, boots on the ground at these locations. And even when you're doing the map dousing, some locations, uh, there's no maps or identifiers to be found. Uh, you know, because I use a combination of things like Google Maps and MapQuest and Bing Maps. And some of them, you know, especially in uh, communist countries, we'll say, uh, they don't allow that access. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to use a map. And so this particular map is a particular animal cat that went missing. And it showed me some of the things that you're seeing on the map. And I put the push pins on there saying, here's where you need to go look. And, uh, you know, it's a, a success story, you know, um, sometimes uh, in this particular case, you know, the cat was in that area, and he, you know, he went, uh, the client or the uh, uh, human companion went and knocked on the door and said, have you seen the picture of my cat? And they're like, oh, yeah, that cat's been hanging out. Here in my <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it was that simple. And, and I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier and the fact that oftentimes in today's society, we don't even knock on doors or, or get to know our neighbors. Uh, so in a roundabout and kind of uh, interesting way, uh, this your cat had formed, uh, you know, your relationship with your neighbor and a friendship. So uh, this case was the same type of situation. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, I asked to show this particular map because you had assisted me with a map. I was looking for a, a lost cat in Manassas. And I didn't want to show it because you nailed, nailed literally, the houses where people were feeding cats, like they were taking care of colonies of cats. And I thought, well, if I show that, 
I don't want everyone to know and like take their cats to that person's <laughs> house. <laughs> but it was absolutely spot on. And in particular, what I want to share with the audience is that um, you described to me the cats that the cat I was looking for was running with. You said there were some friendly cats and ones like this white cat, black spots, and one morning at two o'clock in the morning, I was waiting in the driveway at the feeding spot and didn't you know that they came running out of the sewer, the storm sewer, exactly very as you had described. <laughs> very nice. It was very nice. Well, I wanna move on and we've got a couple of, um, uh, of your success stories. One is a, about a, a cat um, that was in Gaithersburg. I thought that would be good to talk about because it's mid-Atlantic. Can you tell us about uh, Sam, the cat who was lost for 14 months in Gaithersburg? Yeah, Sam is, is a, a fantastic story. And, you know, you brought the fact that, you know, in, in the situation with your cats and the feral cats, um, you know, sometimes we can narrow it down to the exact location, but that's fairly rare, you know, because it's, it, you know, the animal is not always able to determine exactly where they're located at, but they can provide that energy signature of where they're at. Um, but there are those occasions when we find the exact location. And so in Sam's case, um, Sam had been missing for, for quite a while and I was contacted by Sam's human companion. And I did my combination of connecting with Sam, gathering information, uh, doing the map dousing and narrowing down the area. Well, the, it doesn't always happen in the first attempt because uh, there's a lot of, that goes into it. The energy changes around the area. The cat could be moving and moving on, or they could, you know, if you know cats in particular, mm -hmm. they can be right underneath your nose and you don't <laughs> even know they're there. Um, so in this case, uh, the, the first opportunity we had, we connect with Sam and gathered the information. Uh, the human companion went out and did the search and wasn't able to find Sam. And so uh, discouraged, obviously, she continued to try what she could and was about ready to give up. And then finally, uh, uh, later in the year, I was contacted by her again, said, we're going to give us another shot and see what we can come up with. So I did the connection and get, did the map dousing. The area had changed slightly, but it wasn't too far away. You know, it wasn't that far away from, from her home or even the previous location. And so she took my advice, went to that area, knocked on a few doors, posted signs at all the intersections. And shortly thereafter, the phone rings. And she goes back home, discouraged once again, phone rings. And it's a gentleman saying, I think I've got your cat here. Uh, at my house. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to go check it out. So she goes there to check it out. And uh, sure enough, she, he opens the door and there's Sam just there casually like, Hey, what's <laughs> up? You know, here I am. And the whole story behind it was very interesting. The fact that the gentleman had had a cat that looked very similar to mm. Sam when he was growing up. And so when Sam started coming around, hanging around the garage in the house, he felt compelled to take care of Sam. And he really didn't know, you know, at that time, he hadn't seen any signs or posters. He didn't know Sam was uh, missing from his home. Uh, but that situation where we were able to narrow it down and come to find out in this, this particular situation as well, is it's, it was basically on the same block, same city block, and some of the houses that I pinpointed for her to go there and look. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, it worked out fantastic. Sam got back home, lived uh -oh. a, a wonderful, wonderful life. And uh, yeah, everybody was happy and it's always great. You know, that, that's what I'm here for. If I can, if it's meant for you to be reunited with your animals and I can help you do that, then that's, that's the reward. Oh, it's absolutely the most rewarding thing. Let's talk about the lost blind Yorkie because this was a really tiny dog and I believe this was in Texas. Yeah, yeah, BB, BB the Yorkie. BB is a, was a, is a teacup Yorkie. And BB was 18 years old and totally blind. And uh, in this particular situation, um, the uh, my client, um, BB's human companion, contacted me and said, "I've got this. I've got this little Yorkie. Uh, contractors were over. Somebody let the door open. I didn't know it. BB went out, and I have no idea. I tore up the house, tore around the house, drove around the neighborhood. Couldn't mm. can't find BB. Then she went on as she sent me the photo and the information. She said, "You may notice." or you may not, but BB not only is small, uh, but is totally blind. And she lived out on a huge ranch where basically, you know, you have the homes and you have the ranch, and then you could go miles before you see the next house. Mm. And here was this little blind dog out in the middle of the pastures and the fields. Um, so I did my work. I connected with, with BB, gathered up as much information as I could, 
did the map DAO scene. And uh, this one was kind of interesting because when they do connect with me, as I mentioned before, you know, oftentimes it's words or colors or feelings or emotions, mind's eye views, but sometimes it's smells and tastes. And I have no idea, you know, what's going on or where these smells or tastes are coming from, mm -hmm. but it's information that I want to share. And in particular, uh, this situation with BB uh, walking a great distance gave me the pungent smell of uh, wood chips, like shavings, wood shavings, uh, dirt, and metal. And I provided all that information. So uh, BB's human companion was excited, gathered up all the information, printed everything out, setting out uh, to her uh, vehicle to go search for BB a little bit more. And a gentleman pulls up in a truck and says, hey, do you know of anybody that's missing a, a, a small little Yorkie? And she said, well, actually, I am. <laughs> and he said, well, I think I got your Yorkie over at my barn. Well, the interesting thing is uh, this was uh, many miles away. He, uh, somehow, BB had navigated through the pastures, past the cows, past the, uh, the, the uh, horses, through fencing, navigated many, many miles um, to this gentleman's barn. And when uh, BB's human companion went to pick BB up, uh, she noticed the barn. And sure enough, there was a uh, metal crate that they were keeping BB in because BB had showed up and they didn't know what to do with him the, the, the night before. So there was the metal crate inside of a barn where he did woodworking. And so the wood shavings were piled up all around the area where the metal crate was. And then he just dropped off a huge uh, pile of dirt uh, from the fields. So though BB couldn't see, and this little dog traveled many, many miles, those smells were the things that BB picked up on. That was what was shared. And that uh, was one of the reasons that, uh, you know, BB was located and uh, reunited with uh, his uh, human companion. Oh, that's such a happy, such a happy story, such a happy ending too. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about were the, uh, of course, referring people, you have a, some really good information on your website. But what are the first things that you recommend that people do when a pet goes lost? What are the best steps people can yeah, do Yeah, I think the thing that I always tell people is that you, you can't do too much. You know, mm -hmm. so getting the word out there, getting with the neighbors, getting with the neighborhood, posting on social media, all these things we know to do are key. But how you do them is very, very important because you can put together the best poster or flyer that you can and tack it up on every telephone pole or every uh, stop sign in the neighborhood or in the surrounding areas. But when people are driving by, you know, our attention span is very small to begin with. And if we're driving by and maybe we stop at the stop sign, we only pick up that information for a split second. We may only see a flyer for just a brief moment. Rarely does anybody uh, stop and take down the flyer or write down the information. So how you do that, how you post the poster, you want to make sure it's, you know, it's weatherproof if possible because humidity, rain, et cetera, will crumple any, crumple any sort of paper. But you want three basic pieces of information on that signage. You want the word reward. You don't have to put how much. And you may not even give it a reward, but you want to get somebody's attention because money <laughs> gets everybody's attention. <laughs> so you want to put the word reward at the very top. Then you want to put your best photo, best color photo that you have, with the clearest face and clearest body uh, makeup of your animal right in the dead center. And then your mobile phone. And the mobile phone's always, you know, of course, nowadays, a lot of people just use their mobile phones. But that's critical because you're out there searching for your animal. You're not going to be at home. And you don't want to go back home, find the voicemail, and then have to head back out because then your, your dog or your cat or your bird, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. uh, would have disappeared. So I think what, that's one of the key things that I leave behind is, you know, you want to blanket as much as you can, get the information out there the best you can. But the signage and the postage, or, uh, posters, mm -hmm. how you go about doing them, that's the key. You want to make it very simple, succinct and make it as easy as possible for everyone that's uh, willing to uh, see it or is going to see it and is willing to help you out. That's, that's great. And then um, are there any things you should not do? I, we've, uh, you know, you have shared in, the, in your list, like don't walk all over the place calling for your pet because you just confuse them. Can you yeah, say more about you, that? Exa yeah, exactly. You know, it's an interesting thing because you can have a dog, we'll say, that has what we call total recall, you know, that, that never runs, you can take him off leash and he never runs away, never does anything. 
Well, of course, I'm not a big fan of that because I've seen too many squirrels and deer and, and other dogs that are not friendly uh, approach that dog. And then there's some uh, chasing or running away, these type of things. But people feel that in a normal circumstance, you can whistle or call or clap or, or do kiki, you know, however you do your little songs and your animal will just show up. Well, when they're out in the uh, elements, when they're outside or, or even if they're inside of a house, they can't respond very well. And the longer that they're out there, the more they go into a protective state. They've got to worry about themselves, food, water, uh, safety, these type of things. So they're not normally going to be, uh, your normal methods are not necessarily going to work right away. And if you're on the move, by the time your animal hears you and tracks down where your that, that sound is, you may be off to the next area or the next neighborhood. So I always tell people, use your eyes and ears mostly. Um, that will give you a better idea of being able to connect with the animal, uh, listen for any sounds, listen, you know, take a look for any places that they would be hiding. Um, and if you're going to call for them or whistle for them, stay in one location for at least 10 minutes. Stay stationary. And then that gives them an opportunity to uh, connect with you, calm down a little bit, figure out where you're at, and uh, perhaps make a showing at that point. Um, but the, the key thing is the normal methods, when they're out on, on their own um, and the nature's around them, they're not necessarily going to act uh, like they normally would. Well, Tim, this has all been such wonderful advice, and I am so happy that you've shared it with, uh, with us today on our show. So I want to thank you so much for your time and uh, all the ways that you've made such a huge difference in my life and my, my animals' lives. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure being here. And as always, great to see you and great, great to help you as well. your animals and all the animals out there. That's right. Um, so for our friends, for more information about this show, you may visit my website, petinfocafe.com. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm.